Hello. Welcome to the 18th series of the three images of philosophers from the logic of sense. Deleuze will shift gears a little bit here to present different orientations in philosophy. The three images include the philosopher of the heights, represented by Platonism, the philosopher of the depths, represented by Nietzsche and the pre-Socratic philosophers Nietzsche was so fond of, and what Deleuze says is the new philosopher, the philosopher of the surface, represented primarily by the Cynics and the Stoics, and it's this philosopher that's of Deleuze's main concern because it's at the surface where sense gets produced and where sense occurs. Deleuze begins this series by stating that the popular image of the philosopher is the philosopher who leaves the cave to ascend to the heights where the real reality is. This is uh, represented by Platonism, and it uh, refers to Plato's famous allegory of the cave from his book The Republic, where philosophers are chained inside a cave facing the back wall with their backs to the entrance, and all they can see is shadows on this cave wall projected by the uh, either a fire or by the sun behind them. And so these, these shadow images that they've seen are what we see with our senses, whereas the real true reality, according to this uh, allegory, can only be attained by reason. It is only through reason that the philosopher can break these chains, leave the cave, and ascend to the heights. This popular image is of the philosopher with their head in the clouds. And um, Deleuze will connect this with what he calls a philosophical disease, the disease of idealism. He compares idealism to like a manic depressive. And uh, we can certainly agree with him if we look at how many wars have been started and fought based on idealism of one kind or another. Nietzsche will challenge this orientation of thought. Uh, Nietzsche felt that Plato and everything that came after him, inspired by him, was a degeneration and a wandering. Deleuze says that we shouldn't look at Nietzsche's biography or bibliography. Rather, he had a method of his own invention, which was a secret place where the anecdote of life meets the aphorism of thought. And Deleuze will compare this to sense, where sense is engendered by states of life, but it also engenders thought. Deleuze will shift to the pre-Socratic philosophers that inspired Nietzsche, in particular Diogenes Laertius, who wrote a famous book called The Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers, a book written in antiquity, and where Deleuze says that uh, Diogenes Laertius was looking for these kinds of uh, anecdotes of life and aphorisms of thought and their meeting place. The first pre-Socratic philosopher mentioned is Empedocles, which is quite significant because Empedocles is a cornerstone of modern occultism and magic because it was Empedocles who first came up with the notions of earth, air, fire, and water of the basic elements of life. And um, Deleuze will reference that by stating that Empedocles sought the secret of water and fire. Um, but he begins by talking about Empedocles and Etna, which refers to the legend of how Empedocles died by jumping into a volcano of Mount Etna to prove to people that he was a god and not a man. Um, but this deception was discovered when a sandal came back. Somehow that proves that uh, Empedocles was wrong about being a god. But Deleuze will say that this sandal represents Empedocles' descent or dive into the depths of the earth. He'll contrast the sandal that comes back up 
with the wings of Plato. He also talks about Empedocles smashing the statues, which he connects to philosophizing with a hammer, which is another reference to Nietzsche, who said that the philosopher needs a hammer. He said this in his book called The Twilight of The Twilight of the Idols, which is um, saying that the hammer represents smashing conventional beliefs about philosophy, uh, smashing what we normally assume to be true about philosophy. Uh, he'll say that Nietzsche thought that the orientation of thought should come from the depths. With all the forces of life, which is also a thought, and all the forces of language, which is also a body. So he's connecting the two sides of sense here. He'll call this uh, realm of the depths, he'll call that schizophrenia. In the beginning was philosophical schizophrenia, which is what the pre-Socratic philosophers, where their interests lie. But he'll say that Nietzsche rediscovered the depth only after conquering the surface. But Nietzsche preferred not to stay at the surface, but to view the surface from the perspective of the depth. And as we know, the depths eventually conquered Nietzsche um, with his later illness, which is something uh, Deleuze referenced in an earlier series. So in conformity to this method, Deleuze will say that a third type of philosopher arose, which is not quite Greek, part Greek, but also something else. He'll say that rather coming from the heights or the depths, this new philosophy came from the lateral side, from the event, or from the East. And then he'll quote Lewis Carroll to say that all that is good rises from the dawn of day, which is another reference to Nietzsche, uh, his famous book, The Dawn of Day. And um, I also connect that with uh, Thomas Pynchon's Against the Day. Deleuze says these new philosophers are the Magrarians, the Cynics, and the Stoics. And he says, he goes back to Diogenes Laertius, and he says the most beautiful chapters are on Diogenes the Cynic and Chrysippus the Stoic. And he talks about the provocations these philosophers would uh, do. Deleuze will call it a curious system of provocations because on the one hand the philosopher is rather disgusting coming from the depths. He advocates gluttony, incest, cannibalism, all these horrible things. But on the other hand he um, is, acts like a Zen master if a student asks him an abstract question, a question from the heights he'll crack them with a staff, which reminds us of a Zen master. Um, it's, it's well known that the Zen Roshis will often crack their students with their staff to try to wake them up. Deleuze will, con will compare this philosophical hitting of the staff um, that he compares to Empedocles' sandal representing the depths and um, Plato's wings representing the heights. Well, this philosophical staff that gives the blow is trying to wake us up to the surface, to being right here, present on the surface. So in these provocations, Deleuze will go on a bit of, a, on the subject of the mixture in depths. These provocations uh, concern the, uh, the philosophical schizophrenia and how um, things get mixed inside the depths. Deleuze then shifts over to the Stoic philosopher, Roman statesman and dramatist Seneca. Deleuze refers to Seneca's tragedies as kind of a unification of Stoic thought with these horrible things from the depth these mixtures where for the first time they talked about beings devoted to evil. And what rescues the situation in, in Seneca's tragedies is the character of Hercules. Hercules is always situated relative 
to the three orientations of thought. He's either in the heights or in the infernal regions or he's at the surface. But his, his tasks include bringing things up to the surface from the depths or bringing things down from the heights to the surface. And that's why Hercules is the hero. And again, there's a, we can see another reference to James Joyce, who uh, uh, named uh, one of his earliest characters based on himself. He called Stephen Hero. As for the earth, Hercules is the pacifier and surveyor, and he even treads over the surfaces of the waters. The surface is no less explorable and no less unknown than the heights or the depths. He called the platonic orientation conversion. The, uh, the orientation of the depths he called subversion. And this new orientation of the surface he's calling perversion, meaning it's, it's taking the conversion of the heights and the subversion of the depths and perverting that into the surface. Deleuze returns a couple of times to the allegory of the cave in this chapter in his attacks on Platonism, first by saying that the pre-Socratic doesn't want to leave the cave. In fact, he feels that we are not sufficiently engulfed in it and we don't study it enough. On the next page, he quotes someone but doesn't attribute it. I believe it's from Nietzsche because he's uh, talking about Nietzsche in this section. Behind every cave, there is another even deeper and behind that, another still. There is a vaster, stranger, richer world beneath the surface, an abyss underlying every foundation. This chapter emphasizes some of Deleuze's most poetic philosophical writing, and I believe that he's um, kind of writing in the style of Nietzsche, in the style of aphorisms, because he talks about um, aphorisms of thought. And um, I find it, you know, there's much more in the chapter itself than I'm able to present in the video. It, it's a very um, excellent piece of writing, just um, artistic to read. For the esoteric side, we see uh, quite a bit of the uh, mention of the C plus S cipher. We find the Cynics and the Stoics a Chrysippus the Stoic, Curious System, etc. And I'm beginning to take this cipher as an indication of the production of sense, which would, uh, you know, be right to see a lot in this series as it has to do with um, valorizing the orientation of the surface over that of the heights and the depths. And with that, we'll see you for the next series.